Hello and welcome to the official podcast of Palate Exposure, featuring Alona Thompson, a podcast for those seeking the ultimate in wine, food, and travel. Each week, she interviews winemakers, chefs, celebrities, and a variety of guests that shape the way we enjoy life. Good morning from sunny Napa Valley. This is Ilona Thompson with Palette Exposure. I'm here today with Kiel Anderson. You actually may be drinking his wines without even realizing it. I know I have. He's quite a prolific consultant and very highly desired, and he also makes his own brand. Um, I'm very lucky to be talking to him this morning because he has lots of insight on viticulture winemaking as well as marketing. Um, so we'll get to know him this morning and taste some wines in the process. I'm very excited about it. Um, so I guess we'll start with the most basic question, Kale. First of all, nice to have you. Yeah, and thanks for having me, Alona. Thank you. And um, where were you born? Where was I born? I was born in San Diego, California. So specifically in the in La Jolla. So um, originally born in Southern California, but I only stayed there for about a year. Um, grew up in uh, Portland, Oregon, and then uh, back down to California to the Bay Area. And I grew up in the Bay Area pretty much for the rest of my uh, until I was in high school. Um, you know, bounced around a lot. Uh, my dad was. A, uh, well is a surgeon an eye surgeon and he and uh, he originally settled in the Cupertino area and then we moved up to Sonoma County to Santa Rosa nice yeah yeah so I'm a I'm a pretty much a California boy through and through so you know I, I think that in that of itself is so cold because you kind of grew up with California sunshine and it's just a different different way of being and Sonoma it's a bubble let me tell you yeah. Yeah, it's Sonoma County. It's a beautiful right? bubble, yes, yeah. Uh, but yeah, you go away and you realize uh, how fortunate we are to to, uh, to to be here. Yeah. I just got back from a trip to France, which was absolutely amazing. We just the yeah, on premiere. Yeah, yeah. we're on premiere Bordeaux and all over uh, for through many different regions. But uh, it, it was amazing and lovely. But then you come back to California, it's like whoa, we are we're fortunate to live here. Um, I think that's uh, an important sentiment um, for those of you that are listening in other states. We, we, we love everybody, but we are very spoiled is what I like to say in California. Yeah. It's really, it's a really special place. Yeah, and we're spoiled, spoiled on the um, wine growing, wine making side as well. Exactly. Um, so there you are in Sonoma, surrounded by vines. Yeah, I, I was in the middle of the wine industry, just, yeah. you know, when I was in junior high school, high school just not really knowing a whole lot about the industry as a whole, even though I was living right in the middle of it. Uh, mm -hmm. Being underage, I wasn't uh, particularly interested in uh, the industry that surrounded me, um, even though I was immersed in it, uh, you know, cleaning barrels for a summer uh, for, you know, for minimum wage. Uh, it was just you know, Owen was just in my environment, and um, when I went to Davis, I had no intention of going into the wine industry at all. Um, I was more interested in uh, in science and possibly going into pre-med or something like that, um, just because I knew what I was good at, and I knew, and I didn't know what I wanted to do, like most kids, I would say, you know, when they graduate high school. Yes, no, I, I hear that, and yet you, ended up choosing the path that yeah and it just happened just extremely randomly I mean I was in the sciences I took all of my physics and my calculus and my and uh, and, the, and the science and the biology and all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. all my prerequisites um, and I was working in a plant biology lab mm -hmm. um, one of the summers uh, that I stuck around for a summer session at at school, and uh, and the grad student uh, Mark Krasnow, who is now in New Zealand, anyways, a, a great guy. He says to me, "Kale, you know, I was pipetting like I, I, I like I just finished like a four-hour pipetting, you know, marathon. Uh, you know, we were studying." DNA repair in plants in Arabidopsis. So, Arabidopsis. Arab Arabidopsis. That's, that's quite a while. DNA repair. So, anyways, uh, 
I was pipetting for four hours um, in the middle of the summer and he, he says, Kale, uh, you look totally miserable. <laughs> you need to go check out the viticulture and enology program because he was halfway in plant physiology, he was halfway in, in the viticulture program. Um, so I said, okay, well, you know, I'll, I'll go check it out. I really respect Mark. Um, yeah. And, uh, and I took an introductory class and I was, I, 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 would, I would say I was halfway bitten by the wine bug. How about that? Um, and uh, I, I thought it was fascinating, kind of the crossover of, you know, of, of nature and culture and science and, and, uh, and traveling. I just thought it was just such a cool kind of convergence of all sorts of things that I wanted to do. Yeah. Uh, or be involved with somehow career-wise and um, but I would I, I said I was maybe halfway bitten because I wasn't sure whether terroir was you know a bunch of BS like it, it was yeah. was this real like yeah. it like it, or is this just all marketing jargon uh, like is there really something like can I do I really love wine like it can I have I ever had a wine that just knocked my socks off or yeah. like uh, all this talk is it is it just a bunch of uh, smoke and mirrors I guess so then I, I joined a um, a tasting group on campus mm -hmm. um, which was part of the student um, program uh, Devo and uh, and started tasting three days a week with uh, with a student tasting group on, uh -huh. on campus uh it, it it didn't help it also helped uh that at the time you know you could be under 21 and taste wine on campus <laughs> um and there was also a wine barbecue class where like you know a lot of you know attractive ladies went to that class so oh, it was like okay right there. yeah there's a there's a there's all sorts of incentive to uh yeah. to, to to check out the program and um and that's where I think I was fully bitten. You know, it's so interesting to me, particularly from the perspective that we talked about that you're kind of in this cusp of millennial, non-millennial, you know, by virtue of birth. Um, but I think a lot of people at that age, you know, at the college age are struggling. And what you said, I think, is really deserves highlighting. First of all, somebody else acknowledged, but you probably, I know how self-aware you are, knew that you were not happy. So it's important to listen to yourself and that inside voice that says, it's just, it, doesn't, it doesn't feel right, it's not the right fit. And then you did something about it. Right. Um, and then that's when you fully realize that is what I want to pursue. Right. I mean, I think I was at a crossroads even. It's, a, it's really kind of a college experience story for me. I mean, I was at school not really knowing what or why or, you know, uh, I had already taken a, a quarter off Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. my sophomore year to uh, go uh, to uh, teach snowboarding in Tahoe <laughs> you know like I had already like you know I, I was already like ah, like am I wasting my time here yeah. type of thing like why don't I go to do something fun for a quarter yeah. come back and you know kind of rededicate myself and um, and I had also gone to uh, Alaska for a uh, fishing trip uh, in between my second and my third year uh, and it was at, at the same, all of this happened kind of simultaneously. One of my friends had just joined the student firefighter department and were, and had encouraged me to apply for the student firefighter mm -hmm. uh, program. Um, so I was just trying to figure out what I was going to do, why I, I needed to, I, I was just kind of going through a, um, kind of a personal discovery. Yeah. Um, and uh, and thank God I was in I was at Davis because uh, you know not only are the people amazing at Davis but also like the, there's a lot of different people from different backgrounds with different ideas uh, that I was exposed to and I somehow amazingly kind of fell into this community the this wine community that I really started to uh, really get passionate about. Um, uh, while I was at school and I mean I don't think this is any type of normal college experience that I had but yeah. I but I had it and I, and I thank the Lord that uh, that I ended up there and that I that I that I found something that I wanted to do for the rest of my life uh, I don't think that's common anymore when you go to college uh, 
No, and it's actually really refreshing to hear you talk about this critical thinking piece of it. I hold that value very dear because once you start, you ask your, you ask yourself a lot of questions. You you took all these trips, you you tried stuff. If you kind of default into something, you know, just feel this pressure to inhabit certain career path. Unfortunately, once you're in it, it's much harder to get out. Sure. And then a lot of people are unhappy in their jobs. And let's face it, we spend a huge chunk of our lives at work. So if sure. you don't enjoy it, it's a really sad thing. Right. But you, on the other hand, you said, hey, is this a fit for me? I'm going to try it on for size. And that's so well, important. Well, it, it, it took me, you know, over five years to finish college. But I'm, <laughs> I'm glad I did. I think if I went to just about any other university, I might not have finished, you know. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, I found something that I was passionate about and I spent the last two and a half years, you know, like really focused on what I was doing, which I'm just, again, just grateful that uh, I had some really amazing people around me to, you know, to, to help me. Um, really cool. So you graduate with a degree in? In viticulture and enology, yeah. So, you know, grape growing winemaking. So, um, Graduated in '02. Started in '97. Graduated in '02. But uh, you know, I got my degree, and uh, while I was at school, I did some amazing internships. And, oh yeah, let's hear about those. Uh, so I did an internship at uh, Jay Wine Company in Healdsburg. Oh, that's um, good bubbles. So, yeah, good bubbles. Um, learned all about this the sparkling uh, industry, which was fascinating. Uh, yeah. I love to drink bubbles. Um, you know? um, realized that it was extremely hard and time-consuming and expensive to make bubbles. Uh, yes. uh, I don't currently make bubbles now. I'm, I'm sure I will eventually, but um, it was a fascinating experience because I was able to work the harvest and then make it back to school in the fall yeah. uh, to finish my degree. So that was, uh, you know, logistically, it, it worked out really well. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, it worked for... Uh, Oded and Penny now, who is at Rack and Riddle, who does mm. amazing bubbles uh, yeah. and small lot bubbles too. So that's um, exciting. Yeah, and it's such a you know it's one of the most difficult wines to make, if not the most difficult type of program. Absolutely. I just I just got back from France and um, I had one day to kill before flying out of uh, Charles de Gaulle yeah. in Paris. Uh, so I took the TGV. I took the um, the train to uh, Champagne. Nice. So I spent a day in Champagne. I spent a day taking the tour through uh, Ted and Jay and mm -hmm. um, came home with a bottle of Comte de Champagne, which is, nice. I, it's just incredible, uh, you know, the amount of time and effort and uh, the amount of history, um, uh, you know, there specifically. But yeah, I mean, you know, their current release of the Comte de Champagne was 2007. <laughs> so it just, just reminded yes. me like, holy crap, like, you know. Uh, this is art of patience. Yeah, exactly. And on a different time frame. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm so glad you got to have this extraordinary experience. I think you bring back, you know, a different perspective when you travel. Um, yeah. And it influences yeah, you in sure. everything that you do. For sure. Um, so you graduated? In so, yeah, so graduated in Viticulture Technology, Davis. I did the internship at J. Wine Company. And then um, right after graduating, I decided to work um, at uh, at Colgan Cellars. You decided to work. He just says casually at Colgan Cellars. <laughs> well, it, I, it's a super call. How how did that happen? So it, so about at it? the time, you know, it wasn't you know as uh, I guess well known. I guess it was well known, but it just wasn't as um, you know pervasive as it is now. I guess uh, um, at the time, uh, Colgan. Um, this was right after. Um, and um, Colgan and um, Jeff uh, Schrader had, uh, I think, broken up and mm -hmm. had split uh, Colgan hyphen Schrader into Colgan. That's and, right. No, I remember Schrader. that actually because I used to buy their wine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, uh, so uh, they were custom crushing. Colgan was custom crushing at Laird Family, and my yeah. first job. Uh, as their first intern oh my God. was to uh, bring all of the wines up to their new Pritchard Hill estate, uh, you know, the number nine property. And uh, yeah, this is when Marco Bear was the winemaker. Um, uh, Michelle Edwards was the assistant winemaker at the time, who I was friends with uh, from school um, uh, through some friends. So 
um, you know, she was the first assistant winemaker and I was the first intern at, uh, at Colgan and then we crushed the first, uh, first vintage uh, of Colgan at, uh, at, their, at their estate winery, you know, too, which was amazing. We made yeah. some fantastic wines. I learned a lot about the luxury side of the industry, um, you know, and Ann and Joe were amazing. They let me um, uh, stay in one of their properties in Yonville, which was um, which is fantastic and I learned so much and I still have uh, a lot of um, relationships and friends uh, you know my, the godparents to my my kids uh, Beverly Shotwell she's still Beverly and Joe Shotwell they uh, she still works for uh, for Ann she was mm -hmm. working for Ann before uh, Colgan Sellers was a thing wow. as a personal assistant so anyways they're the godparents to my kids so we have all so it's uh, it was an amazing experience and we still have uh, friends to this day uh, from that experience and what a great choice what what made you decide it was just kind of an well I knew that I wanted to work with uh, Cabernet and Napa mm -hmm. um, specifically from mountain sites so you knew that in your mind that well I, I'd, I'd done a lot of tasting when I was at, okay. at Davis and I was most intrigued by mountain grape growing it's good to know um, what you're into. Look what happens. Right. I, I, I knew that's something that I really yeah. wanted to, because I felt really compelled by the wines, uh, you know, from that side of the valley, from the east side of the valley, but also from the west side of the valley, you know, yeah. Mount Veter, you know, Spring Mountain, Diamond Mountain, Howl Mountain. So I was just intrigued by mountain growing and the concentration and the uh, depth of flavors that you could get. Yeah. Sp uh, specifically from the mountains, I would say. Well, I mean, Jared um, Hill... Hello, so mean, yeah, so I uh, I was I was considering I was considering uh, working at Kane uh, uh -huh. over in Sp uh, on uh, Spring Mountain, and I was considering um, uh, and uh, and I had another friend uh, who uh, who was working at a winery, another winery on Spring Mountain. So I was just intrigued by those wines. I guess may just getting mm -hmm. out of school, so I, I wanted to try to focus on that. You know, kind of how I focused on the sparkling exclusively. You know, the year before. Yeah, uh, to try to figure out, you know, which wines uh, really got, and 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 in doing so, and, and working up at Colgan, um, I also got to work with some amazing Syrah that same year mm. uh, from the estate, the number nine estate of Syrah, and that wine threw me for a loop, mm. um, and was maybe the second experience that I had with Rhone varieties that made me decide that I wanted to make run varieties for myself. Um, it was that powerful an experience. Like yeah, no, absolutely. I thought one of the best wines we made the whole year, you know, we made a couple of wines that, you know, some critics gave 100 points. Um, but I, I thought, though, one of the, the, the wines that, out of all the wines we made, made up at Colgan that year, um, the Syrah was the most compelling for me. That's really interesting because um, clearly this is, you know, blue chip winery. Even though it wasn't known as such at the time, there was enough evidence, and you just pointed to the hundred point scores. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the cabernet was fantastic. Yeah. I mean, don't get don't get me wrong. I mean, all yeah. the cabernet we made up there was fantastic. But yeah. um, it was the syrah that is, I mean, I remember it fermenting and it just smelling like you know really spicy olive oil and. Um, and having a lot of freshness and you know good acidity tension. and tension yeah. and um, like some smokiness that was coming out. So I mean it was just uh, it was fast. It was one of those just aha like holy smokes! Like I didn't know yeah. wine could be like this type of moments. Um, and I had one of those types of moments. You know when I was still at school. I mean mm -hmm. there was a tasting that we did on campus uh, called uh, Rones Around the World. You know. There was a Spanish garnacha in the tasting. There was a, uh, you know, I think there was a Saint Joseph. There was a domestic, you know, Paso Robles uh, blend. Um, and then there was like a Chateau of de Pop. And then Australian Shiraz. And it was that, so that, so going back to, yeah. to school, it was that tasting where it kind of dispelled uh, my worries that terroir was just a marketing gimmick. 
right? Like so I, you like, got your proof of concept. I, I got, yeah, I got I, exactly, <laughs> exactly. It was, it was, it was that. It was like okay, the, the the same genetic material, wildly different results. Yeah. Uh, I need to explain. You know, I need to. Th- th- there's really something to this. And I remember, yeah. And then and then it was that that internship after graduating. Uh, where I was like, you know, we made that Syrah um, yeah. alongside the Cabernet, and I was like, wow, this is this really compelling, compelling wine. Very cool. Um, so how long were you at Colgan? Just a, just a season. One so, season, uh, but that was enough. Yeah, it, it, like... was, it was enough. I learned a lot, worked really hard, um, you know, and, and after that internship, um, one of my buddy's older brothers um, in fact, my roommates uh, at Davis's older brother, Sam Baxter, um, ah. uh, he, uh, I got a hold of him. I was actually planning on traveling and doing some, some travel sure. after that internship, but mm-hmm. uh, he offered me a, an assistant winemaking position Very cool. up, at, uh, up on Spring Mountain up at Terra Valentine. And uh, instead of traveling, I decided to take the position. Yeah. And. Uh, and, and and again, that was you know uh, a good decision because um, you know they had a lot of trust in me to uh, at a young age to you know have a lot of responsibility and absolutely I, you know really had to prove myself um, you know that I could handle it. And we made a lot of wine. Not only were we making wines for Terry Valentine, but we're also custom crushing for yeah, always helpful for experience. Oh yeah, and I uh, got to um, work for Andy Erickson. He was custom crushing a bunch of his wines there mm-hmm. at the time. Uh, Craig Becker, who is now at Summerston, was custom crushing a bunch of his wines there. So I got to continue, uh, you know, being um, mentored, mm-hmm. you know, by a, you know not just by Sam but by a bunch of people and Good company. and just kind of just learning. You know, a, a trial by fire. You know, like yes. okay, here is this really complicated uh, project. Uh, you know, prove yourself. And it was yeah. like, you know, and I was hungry to do that. Of course. Um, yeah, and we made a lot of great wines, um, and uh, uh, spent a, a couple of years there at Terra Valentine. I learned a lot and gained a lot of confidence in myself, and yep. you know that I could, you know put my nose to the grindstone and really, you know, have some really good things to show for it. You know, we, we made some great wines those years. So, um, amazing experience, you know, just like yeah. there wasn't a, there, there, there was, there was an enologist, uh, but you know, as the assistant winemaker, it was just like, you know, for a small thing like that, you know, you had to wear a bunch of different hats. <laughs> I bet. No, I mean, this, this is know. ideal right. environment. Um, so what happened next? So yes, yeah, so I was there at uh, Terra Valentine for, for a couple years. Um, and then, um, and, uh, and then uh, Michelle, who was the assistant winemaker at Colgan, she decided to take a head winemaking position at uh, Cliff Lady Vineyards in Stag's Leap. Oh. Um, and then when she took that position, uh, she called me up and she was like, hey, you know, we made a bunch of really good wines at Colgan in, o- in O2, let's, uh, you know, come and, come and work with me uh, and Stag's Leap. Um, cool. And uh, and I did. And um, yeah, I spent my next eight years there at, at Cliff Lady, which was amazing. I bet. Uh, so the the very first project I, I had, you know, after I started at Cliff Lady, was to finish a bunch of sparkling wine, because Cliff had uh, purchased the winery from S. Anderson Winery. Um, they were making sparkling wine uh, before before Cliff uh, bought the property, and uh, yeah, one of the first first deals was uh, to finish a bunch of sparkling wine. I was like, oh well, you know. I get to use uh, what I learned at J Wine Company. How, so, how so serendipitous. Yeah, so we uh, we finished. You know, we hand riddled. We uh, we finished a bunch of small lot. You know, late disgorged uh, wines. You know, uh, Blanc de Blanc, Blanc de Noir, Brut. You know, we, there was a sparkling Shiraz to finish. They were having a lot of fun well, <laughs> making those, have wines. those wines. So I'm like, they're, they're, yeah, they're, they're, you know, they they don't exist anymore, as far as I know. I, I'm sure there's in someone's cellar somewhere, but uh, you know, a lot of them were really great wines. Um, Sounds like it. Yeah, um, uh, but yeah, we got to finish all of those wines, and um, 
which is fascinating. And then, you know, and, and then, uh, you know, be involved with the, you know, replanting of the whole property as well as building of the winery at the property and caves and... Soup to nuts. Yeah, just, uh, you know, like uh, Cliff, uh, when Cliff bought the property, you know, he made a, you know, a, an amazing commitment to really uh, uh, maximize uh, what, what, what he had there. And, and he's obviously done an amazing job. Oh yes, no, um, he's definitely over the years and a force. Yeah, oh yeah, no, he's, he was fantastic, and um, again got to learn all sorts of new pieces of the business and of course. Um, continue to uh, you know grow under Michelle's uh, watch, but uh, also uh, after she left, you know, eventually becoming the associate winemaker and winemaker. Yeah. Um, and in the meantime, you know, working with uh, Philippe Melka as the consultant there. So, I again just kind of continued my, uh, my 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 learning, just kind of sponging everything in. Um, uh, you know, uh, the Abreu wines were also made right next door, and I got to uh, talk to Brad uh, um, on a regular basis over there. So, you know. Um, Cliff was buying more fruit from David Abreu uh, during the time that I was there than anyone else in the valley. So I got to work with a lot of amazing fruit and amazing people. You know, this this sounds really extraordinary. You're naming who and who's who. And David Abreu, you know, probably still to this day is the most famous vineyard manager in the valley. Yeah, yeah, you know, he has, and uh, and he has been for a long time. So it was just amazing to, um, you know see him on a regular basis, talk with his winemaker Brad on a regular basis and yeah. um, just be in that environment and just kind of soak it all in and learn and, and grow. It doesn't get any better than this. In your profession, this is it. It was, it was amazing and I got to, again, I just can't say thank you enough to all the people who, um, you know, um, who have helped me, you know, along the way and uh, taught me the things to do, to not do, to, to uh, you know, what the, what the important things are um, about our craft, um, and uh, in, in, including Cliff, you know, um, uh, he was, he was fantastic to work for, I mean, um, yeah. you know, in 2008, uh, while well, I was still the assistant winemaker there, um, he gave me an opportunity um, to make my own wines. How generous is that? You know, because a lot of contracts in professional environments, you know, right. thus could be perceived as conflict of interest, right? So absolutely. But winemaking community, which is what you just highlighted a moment ago, is so generous in absolutely in sharing and such like that, both on the production side, but also on the vintner side. Right. This is a person that invested a tremendous fortune into Stagsley property, mm -hmm. and clearly, you know, in production and you and he says, hey. Go make your own wine. Go fly, right? Yeah. No, I mean, he, it was. Cool. Um, we had a sit down, and he was like, you know, okay, what are your long term goals in this industry? You know, yeah. what, what do you want to do? And uh, you know, at the time, I'd, I'd been an assistant winemaker for a while. I was, you know, approached by a few other people about being their head winemakers, and I was just kind of one of these things over. And I think maybe he knew this, but. Uh, he asked me, you know, what were my, what were my long-term goals? And I was like, well, you know, eventually making my own wine under my own brand, you know, yeah. the, uh, creatively that would, you know, be really fulfilling. Hmm. So he, he says to me, this was in 2008, that um, I could, uh, as long as I got all of my permits and my licenses and everything, yeah. I did everything above the books. Um, uh, there needed to be a transaction. He charged me a penny per year to crush my own wine, you know, and, the, and, and it was a new winery, so there was some, a little bit of extra space mm -hmm. in the back of the cave. You can make your own wine on your own time, um, you know, in the back of the cave, um, and, uh, and, and you, as, as long as everything is above the board, you know, you're, you know, go be creative. And That's so cool. The conclusion of this interview can be found in the next podcast, already available for your download. Thanks again for tuning in to the official podcast of Pal Exposure, featuring Alona Thompson.